This is the fourth generation Seat Leon in which you have to be very careful what you sing. Why? Subscribe so you don't miss me telling you how it is. Today's episode is brought to you by JNK Limited, expert in anti-theft solutions. Protect your modern car with a modern anti-theft device. More about that later in the episode. And now, on with the review. The Seat Leon is a compact hatchback, which is in production since 1998. Leon means lion in Spanish. It is also the name of one of the Spanish provinces, an old kingdom which became one of the foundations of medieval Spain. Ok, enough of Wikipedia history, let's talk car. Sociedad Española de Automóviles de Turismo, pardon my Spanish, or Seat for short, was set up in 1950. Just a few years later, it went into cooperation with Fiat. The cooperation lasted almost 30 years, but when the money for investments ran out, in stepped Volkswagen. Thanks to the new owner, Seat has access to common parts, to new tech, and that's good. But there are also some disadvantages. I talked about those disadvantages in length in my 2014 third-generation Seat Leon review. After a head-turning second-gen car, the third generation was bland, to say the least, in terms of looks, functionality and even driving. I couldn't understand why Volkswagen bothers keeping Seat alive and offers the Leon between the Octavia and the Golf. But the new Leon is bringing back the auto emotion. I will digress here. Around the time when I started a full-time YouTube career, I had all of my gear stolen in Spain. Nothing personal. I'm sure some of you had something stolen in one country or another, but since then I associate this beautiful country not with the great wine and delicious tapas, but mainly with thieves. Sorry, Spain. And yes, it was bad luck, but sometimes we can help our luck by protecting the things we value, like our cars. Today's sponsor, JNK Limited, offers eJoylog, an anti theft device for modern cars with shift by wire gearboxes like this Leon. There is no physical connection between the gear selector and the gearbox, just a cable. The e-joylock is installed between the selector and the cable and the onboard computer doesn't see it. And neither will the thief who won't be able to figure out why the car doesn't want to shift in gear. And even if they do realize what's going on, the selector is attached with tear off screws and the connector is inside a metal box locked with tear off screws as well. It will take time to dismantle it and it will be noisy. There are two ways to disarm the eJoylock, a mobile app or a token. Install the eJoylock app on your smartphone and pair it with your car. Every time you get in, the eJoylock recognizes the phone and automatically disarms it. Should you forget your phone or be unable to use it for some reason, like, I don't know, maybe it discharged, you can program a disarming sequence of the gear selector moves. You can reprogram it for when you lend the car to someone but you don't want to install the eJoylock app and pair their phone with it. You can also temporarily disable the eJoylock, for example, when you give the car in for service. In case of the token, you can't change or disarm the gear lever sequence, so if you lend the car to someone, you give it to them with the token as well. More about the eJoylock on the JNK Limited website, link in the description below. And now I really want to drive the Leon. So let's go. From a time perspective, I think I understand what happened to Seat. Back in 2012, Volkswagen Group announced a new modular platform called the MQB. There are currently about 30 models based on the MQB, so it's a great way to cut costs by sharing components. But you also need to differentiate the brands, otherwise you can just make Volkswagens in different shapes and sizes. I never expected much from the Golf or the Octavia, but the Leon was always somewhat special. I wanted to feel I'm driving. Meanwhile, after the Walter de Silva interesting second generation, the third generation was more like overcooked dumplings. 
The last time I drove a Leon was in mid-2014. Since then, I think I drove the Ibiza once. It may have been the new one, but I couldn't really tell what was different in it, so I didn't even bother reviewing it. I didn't ask for the new Leon either, but since it was Seat who called me, it's their problem. And it's a good thing they called. The engine. It's the same 1.5 ETSI mild hybrid like in the Golf I reviewed a couple of months ago, but here it's as if they took the muzzle off. The gearbox is the same 7-speed DSG, but here it just reacts much quicker. The steering with optional mode settings is the same, but here it's programmed to be more aggressive. The adaptive suspension is the same, but but no buts, is as bad as DCC in all VW Group compact cars. When I first set off in the new Leon, I was amazed by how quick the steering is. I barely touched the steering wheel and the car was already making a U-turn. I later realized it was in sports mode. The car starts in the mode it was last in when it was turned off. But even in normal mode, the Leon turns like Alberto Tomba in 1988. I later configured the individual mode, steering in sport, everything else in normal or comfort, especially the suspension. In 2014, I complained the drive mode selector doesn't really do anything. Well, now it does, except for the suspension. This is the FR version, so drive mode selector is standard, DCC is still optional, so skip it. It's just noisy on rougher surfaces and doesn't do anything you'd feel on a public road. The seats are comfortable, the driving position is great. Visibility? I praised the previous Leon for good visibility. Here it's not as good, but then most cars these days need thick pillars to do well in crash tests. I'm also not a fan of the virtual instrument cluster. Not virtual instrument clusters in general, but this one in particular because it's hard to read, especially in the fake analog dials mode. It's an option in most variants though. But the Leon must somehow differ from the Golf and the Octavia. So it's got different graphics and tweaked software because different driving characteristics are mainly a result of different programming of common components. In the Skoda or the VW, the steering is programmed to be just meh. But in the SAT, I think the team got a couple of lines of code from Porsche. The steering is really that good. Perhaps the whole car is not as stiff or not as coherent. But the Leon is one of the few cars I reviewed that I really feel I would like to keep for longer. And this is with the Mercedes-Benz GLS parked in the driveway at the same time and next week I'm picking up the BMW M8 and I still want to drive the Leon. That's how good it is. Interestingly enough, despite these programmed sporty characteristics and what I imagined was a more sporty and aggressive driving style on my part, fuel economy was the same like in the Golf, slightly above 6.5 liters per 100 kilometers. But this programming and designing of differences also means you can't get everything you want in each brand. For example, I get the impression the Leon's soundproofing is weaker than in the Golf and the Octavia, and I couldn't find laminated windows on the options list. The Leon has traffic sign recognition, which the Octavia can have only with the full-on travel assist. Meanwhile, the Leon will be the last in the group to get travel assist, so if you want semi-autonomous driving, it's either the Golf or Octavia for you. The Leon's boot is also made worse on purpose. It's the same size, 380 liters, but the shopping bag hooks are smaller than in a Golf. A 12 volt socket or a double floor are an option available only on the station wagon. The optional mini spare is covered with a piece of plywood with some cloth on it. Space in the back is more or less the same like in the Golf. There are two USB ports, third zone climate control, but the seat belts need to be attached so they don't get caught in the seats when you fold them. It's a minor thing, but in the Golf it's just better designed. In the front, beside the hard to read, in my opinion, virtual instrument cluster, 
there's a large infotainment system display with graphics interface that is clearly different from what the other two brands offer. It's a shame there are no physical buttons for basic functions like in the Octavia. There is, however, the voice assistant like in the Skoda and Volkswagen. Here it reacts to Hola. This may be a problem if you like to sing songs of the Russian baritone Edward Anatolievich Kiel. See? But you can turn off the trigger word. I appreciate that Sad decided to use the ambient lighting for something more than just ambiance. Open doors light up red, and if there is a vehicle approaching, the light will come on and the car will sound an alarm. The ambient lighting is also used by the blind spot monitoring system. There are a couple of decent cup holders, a place for your phone, two USB-C ports, small storage under the armrest and medium-sized glove box. Next to the gear selector, there are a couple of trays for your bits and bobs, and one of them is shaped to fit the key, which I really appreciate. The new Sad Leon finally got its distinct looks back. I can see it's not a goal for an Octavia from a distance, especially in the back where the tail lamps are now joined by this light strip running across the tailgate. From far it almost looks like a Porsche. But it doesn't cost as much as a Porsche. The Sad Leon is actually significantly cheaper than the VW Golf. Prices of the new Leon start at €20,300 for a 1 liter TSI 90 horsepower engine. The FR starts at €24,200 with options. This car costs about €34,000. It seems that with the migration to the MQB platform, the sad designers needed time to re-establish the Leon's place in the VW group as the more sporty model rather than just a gap filler between the Octavia and the Golf. And they succeeded admirably. As my time with the Leon is up, I miss this car already, like very few cars I test. And how do you like the new Leon? Have you seen one in the wild? Let me know in the comment section below. And what's up with these subscriptions and thumbs up? Well, the more I get those, the more likely YouTube is to recommend my films to other people. And the more people watch my reviews, the higher I climb on the list of people to get new cars before everyone else. So subscribe, like, share, drop me a comment how awesome you think I am or what a shit show I run here. I read all of the comments and I reply to those that make sense. New reviews every Friday. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.